Um, yeah, so this talk is uh, is entitled um, Working Towards a Brighter Future for Waiters. It used to be called Curly's in Crisis, but I'm hoping that we're um, moving towards a point where it's not all quite so doom and gloom anymore. Um, <clears throat> so it is um, entitled Waiters, but <laughs> there is quite a heavy focus on Curly's, as you will glean throughout the talk, um, because that's my main focus area in my role as a senior research ecologist at the British Trust for Ornithology, where I'm a part of the wetland and marine research team. Um, I'd like to add that this is not only a product of my work, there's a whole bunch of different people, part of the BTO breeding wader team, both past and present, who have contributed to many of the projects that have are being that I will be presenting tonight. So I'd just like to acknowledge John, Mark, David, and Paul, who are part of um, who are or who have been part of the BTO Scotland team. Um, Harry, who just recently joined us from uh, the University of East Anglia um, and is now a research ecologist at the BTO. And I'll be talking about some of his PhD work that he did before he joined us. And then my colleague, Catherine, who's based partly in my, my wetland and marine research team, and then also um, at BTO Cymru in Wales as well. Right, so um, many of you will probably have seen a figure a little bit like this before. Um, depicting the quite severe declines either through the BTO's breeding bird survey data or the bird atlas data of the declines of some of our most common breeding waders in many parts of the country. And many of you might have even contributed to some of the BTO's um, uh, sort of um, voluntary uh, appeals for donations where we've launched a more concerted research program to understand the declines of some of our most iconic breeding wader species. So curlies are where our more recent focus began back in 2015. Um, and over the last two to three decades or so, the UK has lost over half of our breeding curlew. Um, so going to our present state of about 58,000 breeding pairs. And in 2015, it was added to the UK's red list where it very firmly remains now, um, nearly 10 years later. And curly breed across Europe, but they're declining across much of their range. So it's by no means a phenomenon that's restricted to the UK. And so they are um, listed as near threatened on the IUCN's red list. Um, but the UK plays a really central role in the overall global conservation of the species because it has one of the largest um, breeding populations in Europe, depicted by the sizes of those red arrows that you can see in the figure on the bottom left. Um, and it's one of the most severely declining um, populations in all of Europe. So we have quite a big role to play um, in terms of turning the fortunes of this species around. So in the British Isles, um, as you probably are aware, being down in Essex by and large, they're not that common, uh, apart from in the winter um, on estuaries. But in terms of breeding species, they're most abundant in the uplands, breeding predominantly on moorland, bog, heath and nearby grassland, um, with strongholds in northern England, especially the Pennines, Scotland and the northern and the western isles. But there's also small pockets of breeding curlews remaining in some lowland areas, which will be the focus of some of the um, projects that I'll be speaking about later on in the talk. So if we look at a change in numbers using the bird atlas data, you can see both complete losses on the figure on the left-hand side shown by the black triangles throughout much of Ireland, the, the island of Ireland, and also throughout Wales, um, as well as also declines in numbers shown by the blue squares in the right-hand figure, which show declines in numbers um, as opposed to outright losses entirely from surveyed um, 10 kilometer squares. And although there are a few small gains, which are shown by the little orange squares in the right-hand figure, those don't by any means compensate for the wider losses. So that is a, so, a sort of more focused picture on just Curly, but of course, um, our long-term monitoring data sets show the extent of declines for all of the most common wader species. <clears throat> so what are some of the reasons for those declines? If we look at BTO's other long-term monitoring data sets, we can see how the population has changed over time, um, particularly if we look at the more long-running um, joint CBC-BBS trend, 
Um, but we can see that it's a phenomenon that's um, across all of the UK's countries. So not just in England, but also in Wales and Scotland. And in fact, some of the declines are most severe in Wales and in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> so how come waders are declining and particularly curlews? Well, the abundance of birds or the numbers of birds are a product of two factors. You have breeding success on the one hand, so how well um, nests uh, are produced and chicks are hatched and then how well those chicks survive. And then um, on the other hand, we have how well adults survive and how well the young survive after they fledge. Now, generally, adult survival of curlews and many of the wader species is very high. So curlews, um, about 90% of curlews will go on to survive every year. Juvenile, juvenile survival is a bit more of a question mark, probably around 50%. Um, but the area where waders, particularly curlews, are suffering most in terms of their reasons for their decline are poor breeding success. So curlews, for population stability, need to produce about two chicks every three years. But in reality, in the UK, many populations are producing two chicks or fewer every six to 10 years. So this is nowhere near what's needed for a stable or even a recovering population. So what are some of the reasons for that? Well, habitat loss and degradation is the primary cause. And primarily that is a result of agricultural intensification in various forms. So we have the conversion of natural grasslands into arable habitats. So that's an outright loss of nest sites and also converting from these more um, sort of vegetation diverse rich habitats to a slightly more barren arable landscape means that there's no food for chicks. We also have so-called grassland improvement and this is turning what was once um, rich and diverse hay meadow into a, 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 mono, a monoculture of ryegrass which is grown for silage which is cut to feed to cattle. And so that results in both um, the change in the vegetation structure and also drainage. And it creates this really thick and dense vegetation, which is uh, too dense for chicks to move through and too tall. Uh, poor food because it's a less um, diverse type of vegetation. There's not as many species. It's very species poor, obviously, only ryegrass. And so as a consequence of that, there's less food for chicks. And then, of course, we also have this conversion of hay to silage, which comes with a more intensive mowing schedule. So instead of traditional hay meadows, which might be cut once per year in July, we have silage fields, which might be cut three or even four times per year, starting when um, adult curlew are still incubating their nests. And so we have the loss of nests and chicks to agricultural machinery. Um, but this doesn't happen only in the sort of more lowland farm grassland habitats in the uplands and marginal upland areas. Um, you can also have habitat loss and degradation either through um, afforestation, so woodland planting, and through peat extraction, which can result in the loss of nest sites, and also uh, the drainage of these what are otherwise quite wet areas, which can result in poorer food for chicks as well. And of course, if you have afforestation, you might end up creating a reservoir for generalist predators like crows and foxes, which are predators of both the nests and chicks of ground nesting birds like curlews and other waders. So on that note, moving on to predation pressure, it has a major impact on breeding success of ground nesting birds, including curlews, both on nest and chick survival. And the UK has some of the highest numbers of generalist mesopredators in the landscape of any European country. And there's a lot of questions and research going into why that might be, lots of theories out there, and the causes are probably quite complex and possibly differ in different parts of the UK as well. Also, the fact that a lot of this agricultural intensification results in a simplification of habitat and a degradation of it, which makes nests and chicks more susceptible to predation. So whereas you might have some nice long vegetation like this, where chicks can hide from predators and might not have to work too hard to find food. There's other types of habitat where chicks are found, like this extremely short cropped vegetation where chicks basically are sitting ducks. They stand out like a sore thumb and can be really easy prey for any um, predators. 
So some of the ways in which we can um, deal with that and which have um, been used quite widely in the UK, uh, one of which is predator control. Obviously, it can be quite a contentious topic because this involves the lethal killing of predators like foxes and crows. Um, but it is, you know, it's it, it's strictly regulated by Natural England. And obviously, there's a lot of dis discussion and it's a quite controversial subject in terms of how much of it happens. Sometimes um, it does happen in um, in ways that aren't necessarily legal. And uh, a lot of those people might end up being prosecuted as a result of that. Um, but those who are proponents of it um, state that it needs to be legal and it needs to be proportionate and it needs to be a justifiable means of increasing the um, nesting and the chick survival of ground nesting birds. And it's just one measure in a suite of tools. So it's not a single sort of silver bullet solution to predation pressure. And obviously um, a controversial subject, once again, game bird management and um, that whole sort of game bird sporting industry that goes alongside that. But obviously there is quite a lot of lethal predator control that goes alongside that, which does benefit um, ground nesting birds like curlews and other waders. So predator exclusion is one of the other ways that you can deal with predation, managing predation pressure. And this is um, through either fencing individual nests um, using, for example, temporary electric fencing, like in the picture above, or putting up permanent barrier fencing, like in the, the photo on the bottom, or a combination thereof. But this is quite time and resource intensive. It's quite costly. It takes a lot of time to maintain the fences, to change out batteries and manage the vegetation, growing around electric fences so the fences don't short out. And so um, similarly to some of the other approaches for um, mitigating predation pressure. Again, it's not a single sort of, uh, it's one measure in a suite of tools, and it also has its sort of challenges as well as its benefits. So climate change is another factor which will potentially in the future or even increasingly now impact breeding waders. So this is some modeling work that was done by the BTO showing the change in the density of breeding curlews per kilometer squared between 1997 and a projected density in 2080 as a result of climate change. And you can see sort of um, the range and the density of curlews kind of shrinking into these upland areas. And you know, the summer of 2022 was a really good example of that. Obviously it was really, really hot and dry. And those types of um, conditions result in um, a lot of invertebrates not having sufficient moisture levels in the vegetation and ground to be able to survive. And then that has a knock-on consequence for birds which rely on those invertebrates for food for their chicks. Um, and also an increase in the chance of moorland wildfires. So um, there was a lot of discussion about um, some of the fires that occurred um, up north and in Northern Ireland as well in 2022, which resulted in the destruction of, um, of, of ground nesting bird nests, of ground nesting bird nests as a result of um, wildfires. So that's a kind of very broad brush picture of the main factors affecting breeding waders across the country with habitat change and predation pressure kind of the two big sort of headline um, uh, biggest immediate issues and climate change kind of increasingly rearing its head now. But um, the relative importance kind of varies quite a bit between um, different areas very regionally, but also at quite small scales. And so there's a huge value in local studies, which can help to inform the relative importance of these factors um, in different habitats and different landscapes. And they can tell us about what different local populations are doing and what the mechanisms are for that population in that landscape that are most important at affecting that population and what will be the most effective solutions or in other words, what works, where, and why. So there's various different uh, groups in the UK countries, which have kind of banded together as coalitions of um, both government bodies, conservation organizations, and stakeholder groups like farmers and keepers um, to form Working for Waders up in Scotland. We have Gulvanir Cymru in Wales and the Curly Recovery Partnership in England. And the aim of these groups is not only to share information amongst all these different sort of interest groups with an interest in curly, but to connect researchers with practitioners, 
with local community groups and other stakeholder groups like actual land managers, farmers and stakeholders uh, and gamekeepers that have an interest in Curlew and which might actually be able to help implement some of the potential conservation solutions. So the BTO involved in various different projects on these fronts with working with these various different groups and kind of kind of give you a tour of about three or four of them um, over the next 40 minutes or so. So our first stop is in Eastern England, where we're engaged in two projects. And the first is a project that wrapped up last year. It was a joint PhD project between the University of East Anglia and BTO led by a um, former PhD student, now staff member of the BTO, Harry Ewing, who studied the Curlew population breeding in the Brex. I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with the Brex. You've made birding trips there with um, the society <clears throat> during probably March or April. And if you hadn't realized at the time, there is a resident Curlew population of probably about 150 pairs in the Brex. Um, which you might have encountered some of them in March or April if you visited. Um, but, you know, there's quite a large population for the lowlands compared to uh, other places in the lowlands. And so Harry's project was responsible for investigating what factors are responsible for driving the population um, change in the, the Breckland Curly population. And it was up until this point remarkably understudied, even though it's on the doorstep of BTO headquarters in Thetford. So it was specifically looking at Curlew nest success and chick habitat use and survival. And um, most of his primary study sites, which are shown in green, um, cover quite a large variety of different um, sort of habitat landscape types within Breckland. So we have some MOD um, Royal Air Force airfields, like is shown in the picture on the top. We have quite a lot of arable land, um, so a lot of sugar beet fields and cereal crops, like shown in the middle picture. And then also traditional grass and dry heath sites, like shown in the bottom picture as well. And so across the four um, field seasons of his project, Harry monitored about 50 to 8 pairs per year and um, was able to monitor those at quite intensive level. And he reckons based on the areas that he didn't cover, but that have suitable habitat, that there are probably about 150 pairs in this population. So here's a little video, might show a little jerkily for you. I'm not entirely sure how well it comes across over a live stream um, of a day in the life of a PhD student studying Breckland Curlews. Um, so at the beginning of the season, in March, April and early May, there's a lot of nest finding. So he'll go about his study sites using his truck as a mobile hide to locate curly pairs. And when he finds a nesting pair, he'll go and measure the eggs like he's doing in the picture, take some vegetation measurements around the nest, and then we'll be able to come back and monitor the fate of that nest going forwards. He also puts a little temperature logger inside the nest to get a very accurate estimate of the day, the exact day and time that a nest fails. So over the course of his study, Harry measured, I think oh, about 200 nests or so, or more than 200 nests. Um, and they kind of generally followed this pathway <laughs> where they would get predated often at night, which I'll show you a little bit more about in the next couple of slides, often by foxes probably, like shown in the video. Um, and he sometimes would find the eggshell remains, but not necessarily always. Slightly more optimistically, he'd occasionally get um, chicks hatching from nests. So they would make it through to hatch, but then sadly, and apologies for anyone who is a little bit squeamish, look away now. Many of these chicks didn't make it very long and ended up like this one here. And then a very few more positively ended up at about three to four weeks old, looking like this fledgling here. And so a lot of those chicks that made it to this stage would very happily fledge. So the main aspects of his study were trying to get an estimate of nest success. So what percentage of nests and what factors were important in nests nest successfully hatching and what factors were important in resulting in fledging. So 
Um, across his eight study sites, there is a little bit of spatial variation in hatching success, but you can kind of get a picture from this graph that it was pretty low across the board. Um, so kind of varying between, you know, um, just over 0% and maybe 40% with some of these higher um, higher sites on the on the left, uh, sorry, on the right hand side of the screen is probably down to very really low sample size. So there are only two nests in each of those sites seven and eight. Um, so pretty low nest success across the board um, for all of his sites averaged across all, uh, in this case, three years of his study. And those little temperature loggers that I mentioned that he puts in the nest, which very accurately record the date and time that a nest is predated, um, revealed that most of that predation happens at night, which means that it's almost certainly mammalian predation, probably foxes and or badgers. It's impossible to tell between the two. Sometimes you might be able to tell by looking at the, the nest content remains, but you, you can at least say it's definitely mammalian predation. So by far, the predominant um, predator is mammalian of nests, curly nests in Breckland. So what are some of the conservation measures that you can use to increase hatching success? Well, Harry predicts that you can do that by targeting your conservation interventions towards high density sites. So we have um, these two sites in sites one and three in the blue boxes where the density of birds is really quite high and quite a lot higher than some of the other sites. So that's shown by the little um, black line connecting the dots um, on this figure. So it has both a high number of pairs, but they're also very small sites. Um, and so the density is ranging from you know three or four to seven or eight pairs per square kilometer. So there's a lot of birds within a very, a lot of pairs within a very small area. And indeed there's both of these two sites to cover, together cover about 30 to 35 curly pairs, which at current rates hatch about 40 to 50 chicks per year. But if you remember, most of that um, predation happens of nests that are unsuccessful. Most of that happens at night. And so nest fencing um, is quite a good intervention that you can use to protect nests from mammalian predators. That's either barrier, permanent barrier fencing, so fences that you know just act as a physical barrier, and or electric fencing around nests as another option. Um, so those are both effective measures against um, mammalian predators. With fencing, you could increase, Harry predicted that you could increase um, the chick production at these sites, almost doubling it to about 90 or 95, sorry, chicks per year. So that could be a really good measure to boost hatching success in Breckland is you kind of focus your conservation effort towards these really high density sites, these hot spots. So chick survival is the other side of the story. So as he was going about doing his observations of brews in his first year in a kind of anecdotal way, he noticed that um, nearby suitable habitat for chicks often would result in brood surviving. And this contained often a mix of vegetation, which both to forage, but also to hide. So we started looking that into a bit more detail and collecting some more data on it. And he did that by measuring vegetation height across the course of the breeding season at intervals. And so um, you can see that um, he, he took the mean height of basically vegetation blocks. So a block of vegetation is a type that was um, a vegetation area that was all of the same type. So all grass or bracken or short grass or heather or something like that. And he measured that on a weekly basis. Within 500 meters of a nest, he would put down a quadrat and measure that at a random location. And you can see that most of the vegetation is at the shorter end of the spectrum. Breckland is quite a dry place in the summertime. You can see from this picture that it's not like those lush hay meadows that you might get in sort of Gloucestershire down on the Somerset levels, or even some of the hay meadows that you get up in um, the Pennines. Quite short vegetation in Breckland, by and large. So while you might hope that a lot of chicks would get to this stage actually hatching, the number of fledged chicks was not particularly good in Breckland. So very few chicks would fledge. That's so the majority of chicks in every year of the study failed. 
um, the annual um, fledgling rate was really, really quite low. Um, so between 2019 and 2022, a total of 68 broods, and that's 235 chicks hatched successfully in Breckland. But across all four of those years, only 40 chicks fledge successfully, so extremely low. And breeding productivity was highest in 2021 with about 0.37 fledged chicks per pair. So the number of fledged chicks per pair is the number in italics on top of all of those bars. And the lowest in 2022, when only three chicks fledged for the whole Breckland population. So it was that very small, light gray bar. Um, yeah, so very few chicks fledged from Breckland. And when do they disappear? Most of them die in the first two weeks of life. So you can see that things really start to tail off um, from all of your chicks hatching out, or the chicks that hatch out successfully. Most of those um, disappear after about a week with another chunk disappearing after two weeks. And then once um, a brood might get to about four, um, four weeks old, so that's pretty much nearly fledging age, um, all chicks that reach four weeks old fledged successfully. So about three quarters of chicks die before they get to um, three weeks old. So if you can kind of get them past that really sensitive early stage, then you might be onto something in terms of being able to increase chick survival. So that's where the vegetation structure thing came in. So he found that um, taller vegetation can increase the chance or the probability of fledging. So if you look at uh, the sort of landscape around a brood within 500 meters, if they're the, the average height of the tallest block in that, in that landscape, if that was taller, then you had a higher increase that chicks in that area would fledge. So that's good, but it's age dependent. So the use of and survival in different vegetation structures was age specific. I'm not gonna show you a figure for this because it's a very complicated figure, but the kind of takeaway message is that chicks less than one week old used, for, used short vegetation more and survived better when they did but chicks greater than a week old use tall vegetation more and survive better when they did. So kind of the takeaway is you need a bit of a mix of both. So a mixed structure of vegetation heights to increase chick fledging rates across all of those, you know, four weeks until fledging basically, and to maximize your chance that chicks will succeed and get to about 28 days. So that's the nest survival side of things, nest success. So, um, chick survival and how vegetation impacts chick survival, but how do you put that all together to decide where to target conservation measures? So um, Harry is kind of trying to think about this in terms of this sort of schematic matrix, if you like, where on the y-axis, so the, the left hand up and downy bit, the vertical axis, you have how common um, a species might be in the landscape. So at the bottom of that axis, you have um, individuals, it's very, they're very scarce in the landscape, whereas at the top, they're very common. And on the bottom horizontal axis, you've got some measure of demography, like breeding success, where on the left, uh, breeding su su success is very low, and on the right, breeding success is very high. So you can see that um, in areas where um, birds are very, in this case, curlews are very common and their breeding success is high. You might not need to do too much in terms of interventions. You just need to preserve what's going on because the status quo is doing just fine. In areas where they're really common, but breeding success is low, you want to preserve their commonality, but you definitely need to do something to improve their breeding success because it's not cutting the mustard. Um, in areas where they're scarce, um, so, you know, low density, but their breeding success is high. You know, clearly something's going right there. So you want to preserve what's going right, but also create more of the scenario of why it's going right. And in areas where they're uncommon, so scarce and breeding success is low, you need to definitely do something. And so the, the biggest bang for your buck, if you like, um, will be achieved in preserving the status quo. So you'll get really good bang for your buck in this sort of dark green area, in this preserve section where um, a species is really common and breeding success is high. And you'll need to put in quite a lot of effort 
funding money in this case, in terms of conservation intervention. So quite low efficiency, quite low bang for buck in where um, in the bottom left, where individuals are scarce and breeding success is low. Right, so the, consider this matrix in the context of Breckland, which is quite a complex landscape. So all these different colors and all these different parcels show basically diff the different habitat types within Breckland. We have arable, grassland, urban areas, water and woodland. That big green block obviously is Thetford Forest and different blocks of Thetford Forest. And you can't control where curlews nest either. So curlews nest where they're gonna nest. Um, their chosen nests in this case um, in Harry's study are the red dots on the map. Um, the highlighted areas are his study sites. And then the black dots are kind of the available potential habitat that's suitable for a curly to nest in, but where they didn't actually put a nest down. So a kind of random um, allocation of fake nests in the landscape, if you like, nest sites they could have used but didn't. So um, a little bit of a complicated figure, but um, I'll take you through it. So on each panel represents a different percentage cover of different habitat types in a landscape. So on the left-hand side, we have um, the percent cover of grassland in the landscape. So you can think of 0% as being hardly any grassland and 100% being entirely grassland dominated landscape. Likewise for arable, 0% arable means there's no arable in the surrounding landscape. In this case, within 500 meters, 100% means entirely arable fields within 100 meters. And so on for woodland, which is the third panel. And then um, the fourth panel is the size in, in, in hectares of the largest patch within 500 meters of a nest site. So if you pay attention to the black line, the black kind of curve in the middle of those figures, that's the important one. So um, the takeaway message here um, and the arrows point to the important panels is that curlews prefer nesting. Um, so the line goes up rather than down. They prefer nesting in grassland dominated landscapes. So in areas with a higher percentage cover of grassland and areas in and landscapes that also have a larger patch of open habitat. So a larger contiguous patch of open habitat. So that's what they prefer. However, where do they nest? Um, there are less common nesting. So, so there are more common nesting in these um, grassland dominated landscapes, larger patches. There are less common nesting in arable and woodland dominated landscapes. Okay, but where do they succeed when they actually have a nest? Nests were more likely to hatch in arable dominated landscapes compared to grassland. So curlews might prefer to nest in grassland, but their nests don't succeed as well there. They prefer arable dominated landscapes less, but their nests hatch better. So that's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? And fledging rates, if we look at the rate that um, broods fledged versus failed, they weren't higher in any particular landscape at all. So we kind of don't need to worry about fledging. But if we want to do something about improving nest success, improving hatching success. What do we do about this fact that they, they don't really like nesting in arable dominated landscapes, but they actually do better when they nest there. So where do you target your conservation measures in Breckland? So you have your grassland dominated landscapes at the top. Um, curlews are very common in these landscapes, but their breeding success is low. So that's this panel A, preserve and improve. Um, so they're common, but you need to do something more to improve the nesting success in this area. And that might be through things like fencing, as Harry showed in that first sort of example I showed about nesting, um, about nest survival. Put up electric fencing or permanent um, barrier fencing to reduce the incidence of mammalian nest predation. And then you have because um, curlews fundamentally they prefer to nest in grassland rather than literally in an arable field. You have grassland patches in what is otherwise an arable dominated landscape. So provide more habitat of the type that they like to nest in, in arable dominated landscapes where their breeding success is higher. So create more of that. So those are two things that you could do to improve um, 
the fortunes of Kerry and Breckland in terms of actual on the ground targeting, making the best use of um, the resources you have available and kind of targeting it in a, a sensible and a logical way where it will have the most impact. This is the case in Breckland. Right. So I'm going to wrap up that study. Um, and Harry's doing a great job of um, turning all of these into sort of um, literature that will go out um, into the wider world and hopefully contribute to curly conservation more widely. Um, next, we're going to look at head starting. Um, and this is kind of an innovative um, partnership project led by Natural England and involving a whole bunch of other partners. So we talked about some of the conservation man management solutions available for improving curlies um, in terms of habitat improvement and creation, predator control and exclusion, like nest or barrier fencing. One of the solutions that we haven't talked about is head starting. What's head starting? It's when you take um, eggs out of the wild. So in this case, you have a wild population of curlews where uh, a pair will lay a clutch of, on average, four eggs, which might produce, if they were allowed to hatch naturally in the wild, 0.2 to 0.3 fledglings at best, really, in the UK, per pair per year. Now, instead of letting those um, eggs hatch in a wild scenario, you instead collect the nest during incubation take the eggs into captivity, rear those eggs in captivity and turn them into chicks and rear the chicks. And out of those four eggs, you can get up to 3.2 fledglings. So that's a huge massive per capita increase per pair per year in the number of fledglings you could potentially produce. Um, so this technique head starting or variations thereof have been used for various different species, been used for um, cranes to be introduced cranes into the UK has been used for other wader species like spoonbilled sandpipers and black-tailed godwits um, by various organizations like um, WWT and Pennsthorpe Conservation Trust and RSPB. So when might you want to head start? These are kind of some um, sort of um, hypothetical scenarios that um, Jeff Hilton at WWT kind of uses to illustrate the different context in which you might want to head start. So you have this kind of buying time scenario where you've got this declining population, um, which is not producing enough chicks per year shown by the blue line. And in the yellow block, you start head starting for five years across that time. And then you can then boost that population back up to a level which the wild birds, once they start to recruit and breed themselves, still aren't doing brilliant, but it gives you enough time to implement other conservation um, interventions and try and figure out what will work in terms of other management solutions to help your population of declining individuals. The second scenario is you can use it to kickstart quite small populations. So this is kind of what's been done with um, the black-tailed godwits breeding in the Cambridgeshire fens, where you have a very small population kind of just ticking over, um, but not really increasing at a rate that is um, sustainable and is really susceptible to being completely wiped out by sort of random events. And so you want to kind of protect that against that eventual, potential eventuality. And so you can introduce your head starting during your five-year block in shown in yellow and just boost that really quickly up to a level where it's at a point where it's less susceptible to being um, becoming extinct through random events. So those are two different kinds of scenarios. Um, where you head starting could potentially be useful. So there are currently, well, there have been seven different head starting projects for curlews in the UK since 2017. There's currently five running. Each have their own rationale for um, head starting curlews, um, very different reasons, very different methods potentially for doing so. And I'm going to focus on just one. Um, there's various different organizations involved with this. We have WWT um, involved with two different projects. We have um, Curly Country, which um, runs as part of GWCT. And then we have GWCT and the Duke of Norfolk for three of the different sites. But I'm going to focus on this one in Norfolk, which is a partnership um, between a bunch of different organizations led by Natural England, including ourselves at BTO, Pennsthorpe, WWT, Wildgen Hill, the RAF, and Sandringham Estate. 
So in this area of Eastern England, airfields and particularly military airfields provide really ideal curly breeding habitat in what's otherwise largely arable landscape. Um, uh, large expanses of grassland, which obviously, as we've just heard from the section profiling Harry's work um, in Breckland, curlews really like to nest in. But curlews and fighter jets, really expensive fighter jets, don't particularly get along. And so historically, eggs have been destroyed under license granted by Natural England for flight safety reasons. However, head starting, so collecting those eggs and bringing them into captivity to rear them for conservation purposes, presents a very real conservation alternative to egg destruction. And so in 2019, head starting was trialed um, by Natural England uh, with the partnership of the RAF and WWT removing a small number of eggs um, from airfields in Eastern England, rearing them at WWT Slimbridge and releasing those chicks into the wild in Gloucestershire where there is a small wild population. And so the, the project that I'm going to talk about kind of spawned off of that first initial trial. So the rearing is not done in Gloucestershire anymore, it's done in Norfolk. So birds are kind of released back into the natural, um, the population from whence they came. So that in Eastern England. Um, so this shows the, the release location in West Norfolk, bordering the east shore of the Wash. And the blue circle in the map at the bottom left corner shows a very small existing local curly population. So this is just north of that 150 pairs in Breckland that I was talking about as part of Harry's study earlier. And um, the orange star in the map on the bottom left shows where birds are, the eggs and the chicks are reared in the early stages of rearing at Pensthorpe near Fakenham in Norfolk. And then the two blue stars are the two release sites at Kenhill and Sandringham. So the Ken Hill site is a wet grassland site. There are some locally breeding waders, lapwing, avocet, that sort of thing, not curlews. And obviously there's a large number of both migrant and wintering curlews and other waders adjacent to the site, 200 meters away on the wash. And there's some grassland management that goes on at this site, a little bit of predator control as well. The Sandringham site is quite different. It's very arable dominated. There are few, if any, locally breeding waders, you know, lapwings, few oyster catchers, perhaps some stone curlies. Um, and non-breeding waders are about 10 kilometers away, either on the Wash or the North Norfolk coast. And a lot of the grassland in the area of the release site is under countryside stewardship for wildflower meadows. So it's um, managed as part of uh, agri-environment scheme. And there's um, quite a bit of predator control as well. So just a quick summary of kind of how the process works for the project. The eggs are collected from the airfields. They're identified, nests are identified by either um, grass mowing contractors on the airfields or bird control contractors. Um, either the Pensthorpe staff or Natural England staff get called up. They found a nest, please, can you please come and collect it? They come and collect it with a special portable incubator. The eggs are transported to Pensthorpe where the amazing avicultural team there um, rears the eggs very carefully controlling temperature and humidity levels and so on to maximize hatch rates. The chicks are reared indoors in these tubs under heat lamps until they're about a week old when they go outside into the aviaries. So that's the first picture on the left on the second row. And they're kept in sort of um, divided cohorts of about you know, five to eight individuals using this flexible boarding in these um, rearing aviaries. And then BTO gets involved when chicks are about fledging age. When we come along, we do a first batch of measurements for them. Um, and we put both metal um, BTO rings on, as well as individual um, set of color marks so that birds can be recited in the field without having to catch them. And then birds go into these, what are called flight pens, because they can fly now, uh, still at Pensthorpe. Um, and then when they're about 50 days old or so, um, they get transferred in the back of a truck, back of a pickup truck in boxes to the release sites, which takes about 20 minutes to 40 minutes um, drive away. And at this point, um, they're either put in pens um, there or a small number are 
um, tagged, either with radio tags or GPS tags before being put in the pens. And about a week or so later, the door gets removed from the pens. Birds are just allowed of their own accord to walk or to fly out uh, into the wild. So results so far. Um, over the three years of the project so far, the first year of releasing was 2021. Uh, a lot of eggs collected, about 100, quite variable between years, 60 in 2022, uh, about 80 this year, um, with a variable number released across the two different release sites. So we had nearly 80 released in our first year, about 40 last year, uh, 40 in 2022. Sorry, forgetting it's 2024 now, um, and about 40 in 2023 as well. And um, in the first two years of the project, um, the type of post-release monitoring that we did at BTO included these individual color marks, which you'll see a picture of in a minute, um, as well as GPS and radio tags. We decided that GPS tags provide far more bang for buck. Um, and so we used more of those in 2023 and ditched the, the radio tags. So what does the post-release monitoring show? Well, Color marking is a great sort of fairly low effort way to get information on what these birds do after they get released out into the wild. So they've got these um, little colored flags on their legs with a unique um, letter, letter or letter number or number letter combination paired with an orange ring, which denotes them as from uh, the Norfolk Head Starting Project. And these birds have been seen all over the UK and with a few seen a bit more sort of in foreign locations in Ireland and also um, in Brittany in France. But most of the birds you can see from the bottom map um, with all little pink dots clustered around the wash, around the wash, most of birds um, are seen around the wash where there's um, a local volunteer group, um, the, the wash waiter research group, which color marks a lot of the own, their own birds that they catch, their own curlews. And so there's a lot of effort put into reciting color marked birds already. And so they also see a lot of birds from the Head Start project as well. Um, radio tags um, was a great way of finding out how long birds stayed around the release site and also about leading us to um, mortality events. So when birds were predated post-release in the vicinity of the release pen, um, which led us to be able to um, sort of collect the carcass of poor individuals like uh, 2J on the on the right um, and send those off for post-mortem to see if we could figure out what might have predated them. But by far the most information is gleaned from GPS tags. And we have increased the number of GPS tags that we've put out over the three years so far of the project because they just provide a fantastic level of detail in terms of what birds are doing after they get released. So the next slide shows hopefully a fairly smooth running video animation of GPS tags. So these tags are collecting data every um, 30 minutes and then they send them over the mobile phone work, phone network once a day to my computer. So you can see those birds on the right at Sandringham kind of just went for a little jolly together and then dispersed away from their release site. But more purpley colored birds, Ken Hill, have kind of stuck close to home a little bit with a few sort of adventuring here, there. We've got that kind of teal colored bird on the, the right hand most side, showing a regular tidal commuting pattern between the North Norfolk coast and an inland site. And here comes a second release cohort, which kind of zoomed away from its release site a little bit faster. Whereas the Ken Hill birds again, they stick quite close to home, probably because there's a lot of wild birds nearby. There's that um, greenish teal bird that's taken up residence in the mouth of the Great Ouse near Kings Lynn. You can see as the season goes on, birds start to disperse away a little bit more with one just kind of zooming off the left of the screen, which you'll see what happens to in a moment. So this is after about six weeks or so after the very first release happens. It's kind of, this is the state of play. So most birds are still around the wash at this point, but they've dispersed away from their release site. So if we look at all of the data together from the GPS tags, there's been a grand total of two long distance movements that we know about, 
one bird that did this big loop out over um, the Atlantic before deciding yeah, better of it and returning to um, the coast of Southern Ireland. And then this other bird in the more sort of magenta pink color that went down to spend the winter and where it still is now on the north coast of Brittany in France. But there's a lot of birds which have stayed locally. Um, and this shows all of the local movements of all of the tagged birds which have been released so far, some of which um, from previous years are still transmitting now. So the tags should stay on for um, between about six months to two years before they fall off or kind of shed naturally. Um, the harness that they're used to attach with will break and they'll just fall off. Um, so these tags provide a really um, interesting look at how birds move around the landscape post-release. We have those nice little video animations, but we can actually analyze those data in a little bit more detail. So these, um, these next two slides will show four different panels. Um, and the first will be one week post-release, the data two weeks post-release, six weeks po post-release, and then all the data through from the time of release to the end of the calendar year in 2022, so to the end of December. So one week post-release, you can see birds stick in quite a tight area around the release site in this case. But after two weeks, they've kind of bloom, spread out quite a bit, have started to disperse away from the release site quite a bit. And six weeks looks very similar to that. And indeed looks quite similar again to, sorry, to um, the data if we aggregate it right through from the day of release to the end of the year. So birds stick quite close to home for one week before kind of getting brave enough to um, disperse away from their natal site, if you like, if you want to call it that, their release area. And if we look at the type of habitat that they used for all those time periods, you can see that the black bars in these figures show the habitat that is used compared to what is randomly available in the landscape. So if the black bar is taller than the gray bar, its neighbor, that means that a bird preferred or used that habitat more than might be expected by chance. So it, can't, it preferred that habitat effectively. So after a week post-release, we have more coastal habitats. So intertidal salt marsh habitats on the left of all of the figures and terrestrial habitats, arable and grassland on the right. We can see after a week post-release, birds are really sticking close to these terrestrial types of habitats around the release pens, so arable and grassland habitats. And if we look at all the rest of those time blocks, you can see grassland, the black bars for grassland, stay quite a bit bigger than the gray bars. So birds continue to prefer grassland right through until the end of the calendar year. But they start to increasingly pick up other habitat types over that time period. So two weeks post-release, you know, they're starting to visit salt marsh. Um, and indeed that's the same at six weeks post-release. And then by the time you get to the end of December, they're starting to act more like non-breeding adult curlews using both salt marsh and coastal intertidal habitat, as well as grassland habitats, which we know curlews do in many areas. So starting to act in terms of their habitat use a bit more like adult curlews. Um, after they've been in the wild for about six months and kind of learned how to be a curlew. So there's a lot of interest in head starting curlews. Um, what have we learned so far from this project? So the majority of birds stay local to the release area over winter, particularly if there's a large overwintering wild curlew population. We have, you know, fairly typical migrations for the Eastern England population from what we know of where Eastern England birds go. Birds stay very local to the immediate release area in the first week of release after release, but they start to disperse from about two weeks onwards. And there is a very strong selection for grassland and salt marsh habitats early on with increasing usage of these sort of intertidal habitats or adult curly like throughout the autumn and the winter. So what happens next? So the big question, which everybody wants to know is, are release birds going to recruit as breeding birds local to where they were released? And when are they going to do that? Um, so we don't really expect curlews to start to recruit until they're three years old. Um, 
And so this year, well, 2023, sorry, last year um, was um, the first year where we might have expected birds from 2021 to start to return to potentially breed in the area. So we did surveys around the release sites, but no birds were seen attempting breeding in a survey of kind of like random tetrads around the release sites. However, um, we have some sightings and GPS tag data, which tells us potentially uh, indicative recruitment or prospecting of different breeding sites. So this is 0E, which is a bird released with a GPS tag in 2021, where it spent most of its first 18 months or so on the wash until May 2023, when it paid a brief visit to Wheating Heath near Thetford, um, uh, and where it was also seen, as well as its GPS tag data transmitting from there. It went back to the wash before going to uh, spend a day or two on the old estuary in Suffolk and ending up on the Medway estuary in Kent at the beginning of June before its tag either fell off or stopped working. Um, and then we have a bird which was recited. It's a color marked bird only, no tag, which was recited in Staffordshire of all places, quite a long way from uh, Norfolk uh, in the middle of May in 2023 as well. Um, not what we expected, I have to say. If Norfolk birds recruit to um, the population of birds in Staffordshire, not ideal really, we'd like them to come back to Norfolk, but time will tell and um, the percentage of birds recruiting year on year, um, you know, curlews can um, delay their first breeding attempt until four or five years of age or even six years of age. So the jury's out for quite a while yet as to whether head starting is an effective potential conservation intervention for curly. Time will tell. Okay, we're on the home stretch. So my final section is talking about some projects which are working in partnership. Um, and this is super important for curlews because you need both this sort of like top-down governance from you know, the likes of government structures like Natural England and DEFRA, but you also need a lot of bottom-up support and action from the people who are delivering land management on the ground, stakeholders like farmers, other land managers, conservation practitioners, gamekeepers, and things like that. And they can become a really integral part of the monitoring process, which gives them ownership of the outcomes, more belief in the outcomes, and also the decision-making process, and ensures that there's really good communication between all these different sort of groups. Um, and so you have this sort of partnership structure across levels, but also across different sectors as well. And waiters, and especially curlews, have this way of sort of... Um, I guess, galvanizing action because of this common cause. And so people are able to, these different groups, which might have been in sort of conservation conflict, if you like, before, and kind of set aside their differences because there is this shared common vision in terms of improving the fortunes for ground nesting birds like curlews. So some of the work that we've done um, includes this sort of mapping of wader abundance zones. So this is a tool to guide government plans for woodland expansion so and minimizing the adverse impacts on breeding waders. So I mentioned earlier, um, afforestation, woodland planting, not particularly great for waders. So this is a tool that can be used to avoid planting trees, which are going to be used, obviously, as part of the government's um, climate change mitigation strategy towards net zero. Um, a way of doing that in a way that's not going to um, adversely affect sort of declining species like curlews. So this uses citizen science data to model wader distribution at one kilometer square level using very fancy statistics, which I won't go into. It basically predicts the relative abundance of different species of waders for each one kilometer square in Britain. So we can use curlews as an example here, where we basically can separate the density of birds into these different strata. So effectively mapping what are hotspots. And you kind of get areas that you'd expect curlews to be really common in coming out as the hotspots. So Pennines, the North York Moors, parts of Scotland, um, Caithness and Sutherland, and parts of the Northern Isles. Um, and so you have these sort of maps which you can layer on top of each other for all the different species. 
So you've got a similar map for lapwing, redshank, oyster catcher, so on and so forth, and develop these waiter hotspot maps. And this allows you to do several things. Um, you can use it to target waiter conservation measures. Um, so for example, um, creating waiter recovery areas or targeting agri-environment towards particular areas or hotspots. You can use it as high-level guidance to steer developments like woodland planting or wood farms away from really important waiter hotspots. And you can use it to determine levels of scrutiny that should be associated with, for example, housing developments or things like that. And so this is a tool that's um, being used currently by Forestry Commission and Natural England in terms of both as woodland planting guidance and, um, and the development of these weight recovery area hotspots. And it's a freely available map, which can be seen at that web address um, as well as on the Forestry Commission website. So some of the things we're also doing is expanding our waiter monitoring capacity into sort of more non-traditional areas. So many of you might also already be BTO volunteers in some capacity, might do BBS or webs perhaps, or be a ringer. Um, but there are audiences which um, work in a lot of areas which are poorly covered in terms of these sort of more traditional volunteer citizen science surveys. Um, where breeding waiters are very common, um, in areas of farm landscape um, or um, game bird estates where we can sort of galvanize the stakeholders who traditionally work in these areas to actually contribute to the monitoring process. And we have various different schemes, including the waiter calendar survey and gamekeeper transects where um, these local land managers and stakeholders can actually contribute to the waiter monitoring process. So one way in which we're doing that is actually working in partnership with farmers and with the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority as part of a farming and protected landscapes project across two years. And this is a program which is funded by DEFRA, providing what it says on the tin, basically, funding for um, wildlife friendly measures and research and sort of habitat recovery in protected landscapes, so national parks and AONBs and so on. So this is working in the national, uh, the Yorkshire Dales National Park across a number of different farms, um, engaging farmers in wader monitoring, which will then, the data that they collect will then be used to feed back into developing um, agri-environment options as part of new agri-environment measures um, and schemes, which will then feed back into the monitoring process in the sort of um, in the sort of feedback loop. So, in addition to traditional survey approaches, which are being done by volunteers for the national park, farmers are also putting out acoustic monitoring devices, which just passively collect information on um, waiter calls and songs and chick activity and so on throughout the breeding season which then can be used to compare against um, the survey, more traditional volunteer survey methods, which um, occur only in sporadic visits throughout the breeding season. And one of the other things that we've been doing is looking in more detail at habitat use using GPS tracking to collect information on which habitats are the most important for um, breeding curlews at different stages of the breeding season throughout the dales in different types of landscapes within the dales. So uh, last spring, we put out GPS tags on 17 breeding birds, three females and 14 males, which are very similar to the tags used on the Head Start birds. These ones collect data every five minutes, so very, very high resolution data. Um, and this is an example of the type of data that they can collect. Um, so this is quite small, this is at a field level. And you can see there's a couple of hotspots here. We have the hotspot under this star, which is the nest site. So you can really see that focal area of points. But this was a nest that actually failed. And then you can see that the birds moved over to this kind of area of this post failure kind of breeding activity. But you can see that the, the habitat use for this pair is very much constrained to the field. Um, and they don't really foray um, too much further than their patch. And this is something that we've seen that's quite unique in the Dales because of the incredibly high breeding density of birds there. 
that habitats, are, um, territories, pardon me, are incredibly discrete. Um, and many of them can be delineated along field boundaries like walls and so on. Um, and you can see these almost invisible um, boundaries between territories, even within the same field. So if you aggregate all of that data across the breeding season for all of those 17 birds, this is what it looks like. If you look at the top panel, this is kind of a picture where each color shows a different bird of where birds would spend about 95% of their time throughout the breeding season. Um, so quite discrete clusters, but they do move around a little bit. But then if you look at the real hotspots within that, where birds spend 50% of their time, which is the bottom panel, you can see it really narrowed down on a very small areas really, which is the really the breeding territory around the nest site. And then if you then extract all of the different habitat information to under those little shapes, you can see, get an idea of the sort of habitat selection preferences and habitat usage during the different breeding stations, stages for um, curlews breeding in the Yorkshire Dales. So each of these different bars represents an individual and each of the different panels represents a different stage of the breeding season. So you have incubation on the top left, chick guarding on the top right, and then post breeding or failure on the bottom. You can see quite a bit of difference in habitat usage. The sort of detail isn't terribly important, but it changes throughout the breeding season. And we can look at um, particularly what is most important for curlews during incubation, and particularly most important what is most important in terms of their habitat usage during chick guarding. And so agri-environment schemes can be targeted towards creating more of the habitat that um, curlews might prefer or use or need during the brood rearing um, part of the breeding season. Rightio, almost done. So the final project, which I'll just briefly skim over because it's still kind of in its nascent stages, um, is the Curly Solutions Trial Project. This is a project that is um, being run by the Curly Recovery Partnership um, as part of the Species Recovery Program, which is funded by Natural England. And as part of this, um, it involves a review of the threats that are um, curlews are facing and solutions to the th threats for curlews breeding in grassland landscapes throughout Europe, not only in the UK. That's underway right now. Um, within the UK, a stakeholder consultation process on potential grassland management approaches for curlews. So there's no use in us as conservation practitioners or conservation organizations, scientists, going away or even government. Okay, this is what you need to do for curlews. Um, that will be the best for them. Go away and do that if farmers find it completely uneconomically viable. So this is involving them in the process of designing options that are um, both practical and beneficial from a curlews perspective, but also won't break the bank and are economically viable and feasible from a farmer's perspective, for example. And then finally, a more field trial, which is assessing the factors which are important at influencing nest success and chick survival in different um, farmed grassland landscapes around England. So we have five different study sites across the country um, where we'll be looking at testing interventions like nest fencing and also um, looking at different grassland management type interventions and how that impacts both nest and chick survival. So with that, I'd like to thank both all the different funders for these many projects and various colleagues at the BTO at UEA, um, the Head Starting Team, Curly Recovery Partnership, and the Curly Solutions Trial Project Team, as well as the many volunteer surveyors and stakeholders who have contributed to these projects and really without which we wouldn't be where we are now. And with that, I will stop and I guess Someone will be feeding through the questions that are coming in via YouTube because I don't have access to that. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you, Sam. Um, could I just ask you to stop your screen share? Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Right. That was really interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, so 
there's so much data and and so so much has gone into this already and and it as you said it's still kind of in a in a, almost a, an initial phase really it's it's what you do with all very much so where where it goes from there um so yeah absolutely fascinating to to see all of that information um we don't have any questions as such yet in the chat but hopefully somebody will come up with something fingers crossed um i did write down <laughs> a couple of things myself so um no one <laughs> you, you, <laughs> uh, the habitat use change after the released birds um so when they go from sort of staying fairly local to then going mm -hmm. to salt marsh and the coastal habitats i presume that that's when they start to sort of mix up with wild flocks and yeah and... exactly that yeah okay um being part of um so i'm also part of the wasp wader research group who kind of catches um and monitors waders sort of non-breeding waders on the wash mm. um and we're often running field work at about that time of year there as well um in august and september and you can kind of spot the head starts because they are the birds that kind of don't know what they're doing <laughs> or they don't look like what they're doing they're kind yeah. of like either on the edge of a wild flock or they're kind of doing their own thing like in some ridiculous place where a curly wouldn't normally be found like near a bramble bush or something like that and okay. you're like aha there's a head start bird it's not you know it's still a juvenile effectively and we see them often mixing with wild juveniles the few that there are um and they're all the, the kind of birds that are kind of naive, don't really know what's going on yet. They haven't quite learned to be wild curly, whereas ones that have were released, you know, one or two years ago now, which we see as part of the wild flocks, are very much integrated with the wild flocks of adults. Excellent. That was going to be my next question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that they do definitely sort of learn. They do learn, they do learn how to be a proper curly, yes. <laughs> That's good. Um, we've got a couple of other um, questions hopefully coming in. Hang on. Richard Chu. So we've got some messages on here. Um, people saying hello. Uh, Les Malloy, Steve Grimway, Richard Chu. Um, Steve Hallam said, uh, Sam, it's a fascinating talk. Um, the parts that he understood anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, we you will can be watch uploading... it again and try and glean more the second time I was just going to say, yeah, we are <laughs> uploading this. So if you want to go back and do it in slow motion, you'll be able to do that if you wish to. Um, Richard said, uh, wonderful birds, his favourite wader. Um, such an evocative Good. call, whether on an es Essex estuary in winter or on an upland moorland in the spring. Absolutely. Um, Karen Mace saying, thank you, fascinating talk. Um, Richard, again, well done to everyone involved in the project. Just echoing your sentiment. Uh, you know, it, it is. I mean, obviously you're giving the talk tonight, but there are so many people that are involved yeah. in this, aren't there? From, from Absolutely. Ground yeah, yeah. Um, Brian Priestley said, I think the RSBB were doing other projects for Curlew in Northern Ireland, for example. Right. Um, is data shared to strengthen strategy development? Yeah. So um, most curlew people, <laughs> for lack of a better word, uh, oh. we all talk to each other, um, sometimes some more frequently than others. Um, but there's, I mean, there's various different mediums through which um, this information is shared. So the curlew project, the RSPB curlew project that he's referring to um, is the Curly Life Project. You can type into Google, type Curly Life RSPB. Um, that's in its, I think, penultimate or final year. I'm not entirely sure which. Um, and there's five different study sites, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, Scotland, and Geltsdale in England. Um, and the Northern Ireland site he's referring to, there's two. There's, I think, Loch Earn, um, or one of the other lochs. I'm not entirely sure which. Uh, and Glen Wherry in the Antrim Highlands. Um, and you might have come across mention of the Glen Wherry site because they have just phenomenal breeding success there. And we're all like, what are they doing? And can we can we share some of that success? Um, they, they have really seen a huge number of chicks um, fledge Fantastic. per year. And it's a combination of a lot of things. So just a lot of things going right um, mm. at that particular site. But because we know that um, there's a lot of variation in what works in different places, what is working there might not necessarily can might not necessarily be able to be replicated in other places. So right. it's kind of learning what those different factors are that I guess it's hit that magic sweet spot. Trial and error as well, almost. You can say well, it, it is. You know, should we try that over here? Yes, it did work. No, it didn't work. And and yeah, yeah. Okay. And a lot of local projects are undergoing exactly that process. Mm. Um, Richard said, are there any ways that um, society members can support research and recovery programs 
other than by donating to the BTO, Curly <laughs> Action, etc. So obviously that's one really good way of doing it. Yeah. But anything, I guess he means anything more hands-on. Hands-on, uh, practical yeah. on the ground. Um, short of, you know, contributing to a lot of these sort of um, volunteer citizen science schemes, hmm. um, whether that's, um, so as part of BBS, um, we have these, what has been for the last two years, I think we're kind of putting it on hiatus for this year, unless people really, really want to do it, these, what we're calling like third breeding waiter visits to kind of try and get an idea. If you have waiters on your, um, in your BBS square, having a third visit after the, the sort of second visit to try and get an idea of whether BBS can be used to get a very broad index of productivity breeding success if okay. there are breeding waiters um, in your square. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I guess I guess following on from that as well, any, you know, any way the reports that, that are received all contribute towards the big picture anyway, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Colour marked birds, you know, I'm sure there are head starts down on Essex estuaries. Um, I've never had it. I haven't had a report myself, but I, I'm sure they go down there. So well, there's a, <laughs> it's a challenge for someone out there. If you can, yeah. We can find one of the colour marked birds in Essex. That would yep. be really good. Yep. Um, Steve Hallam said, regarding the way forward, how do you see the balance between small scale resource intensive techniques such as predator fencing yeah. and head starting versus larger scale rewilding, uh, for example, NEP and Wild Ken Hill? Yeah, it's a tricky one because, you know, inherently a lot of rewilding processes um involve sort of natural um regeneration of open habitats to more shrub dominated and eventually treed landscapes depending on how much sort of grazing intervention and so on you might have um so that has kind of been this say elephant in the room exactly but it kind of fits into the whole sort of like woodland planting natural woodland regeneration and so on mm. um discussion about how do you make those two you know species that prefer open habitats like ground nesting waders play nicely with um sort of natural rewilding woodland regeneration which is equally important for a different suite of species mm -hmm. nightingales mm -hmm. turtle doves etc etc um because the two don't necessarily go together that well um mm -hmm. and i think it is and, and that's sort of something that BTO is working on in a different context is making sure that the right things are done in the right place. So, you know, a rewilding project right next to a massive breeding waiter hotspot with really high density of breeding birds might yeah. be a little bit like not the best place for your rewilding project. Well, I guess it's an educational um, thing as well, isn't it? So, you know, from the from maybe the general public's perspective, if if you're seen to plant loads of trees and bushes, you're doing a great thing for rewilding, but Obviously, that's as you said. That's only for one particular type yeah. of habitat. It's, it's it's important across the board. So, and we have to kind of you know think back historically, where you know nesting curlews have declined substantially since you know post war levels, but you know if we think back to you know pre Roman Britain, pre mm. you know when you know maybe things were a bit more treed, um, or you know Neolithic Britain probably weren't that many curlews here so um probably not no. so you know at, in what context you know what's our baseline that we're measuring against and what mm. are we trying to get back to so we're trying to get back to a pre-agricultural intensification kind of level you okay. know is that achievable is that is that what is, is that the end goal i don't know um mm. and who determines that end goal it's not me <laughs> or any conservation well, no, organization no, not no, necessarily no. government either yeah um so, you know, that's something that we kind of haven't really tackled, I would say. You know, what what's what's our target? What are we working towards? We kind of have conservation obligations. Um, curlews are listed as near threatened um, at a global level, listed as an endangered, vulnerable in Europe. Um, and we have a part to play in conserving their population in Europe. But what exactly is that role and what, what's our target? Mm. Good question. Okay. Good, a very good question yeah that's a, that's a whole other talk I think yep um I was going to ask actually and I may have misunderstood this so forgive me if I did but the, the population in the Brex um I think one of the graphs that came up said that they whilst they prefer the grassland habitat their their nesting success was slightly better in the arable habitat correct or, yes yeah. any idea on why that might be is there anything to do with well, maybe less, less predation in arable areas or bingo yeah probably um 
there's not really any food for predators in arable landscapes. Mm. So mm. they're just not, you know, they're not moving through those landscapes, presumably because um, food is much more scarce. And so they're not encountering curly nests. And so curly nests might succeed um, a little bit um, better there. That's kind of Harry's theory anyways. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we've got lots of questions coming in now. So um, oh, <laughs> Rick Richard said, in terms of breeding productivity, if they survive the high chick mortality, at what age do curlews begin to breed and what is the average lifespan? Yeah, good question. So this is kind of obviously plays into the, the head starting recruitment question quite a lot. A kind of like, when will we know whether head starting works? Because, you know, working is, you know, the birds that you've released come back to the area where you've released them and recruit into that local breeding population and start to breed themselves. Um, so we don't have brilliant information on that from the UK. There's a long running Dutch study of about 30 years, which has color marked like all their chicks over that time period. Okay. And that study has shown that actually the, um, the first breeding age can vary quite a lot. So I think in that one, you have a, a, a very small percentage returning to breed at two years of age. So kind of in their first potential breeding season. Um, about a quarter returning at age three, another quarter returning at age four, another quarter returning at age five, Ooh. and like the final fraction returning at age six. So you might be waiting a long time. And I think the average dispersal distance for that project was about 12 kilometers from their, right. their natal site. So okay. reasonably close, um, but ranged quite a bit, obviously. Mm. That's interesting um, how it can take them so many, you know, such a difference in, in time scale before they eventually come yeah back. so you know we're talking about the scale of you know like long-lived seabirds in terms of you have to mm. remember that curlews live to 25 30 years so they're very long-lived birds mm. so the sort of like low breeding rate in terms of taking a long age to reach the first age of breeding not necessarily a huge surprise if you think of you know like guillemots or puffins or something but yeah, take a yeah. long time as well to recruit to first breeding age yeah. Um, and there might be a little bit of moving around, you know, the sort of visiting different breeding yeah. populations. Where do I want to settle? Finding their feet and, and working yeah. out how to get I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, Steve Grimwade said, great talk. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'd certainly echo that. Um, Jan Lewis said, brilliant talk, Samantha. Appreciate everything BTO does. It is evidence-based. But what is your gut feeling on Head Starting? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah i you honestly have a gut feeling <laughs> <laughs> honestly I, I get asked that all the time by okay. you know various projects that are like you know should we do head starting and i would say um a first of all if you want to do head starting make sure you do it for the right reasons like there's people who are like i want to do head starting because it's like the new sexy tool right for curly conservation oh. but um it's a one approach it's not a cheap approach you have to have really good post-release monitoring because it's not any use just, you know, throwing curly out into the wild and not knowing what happens to them afterwards. Yep. Um, and you, you have to make sure you're releasing them into an area where you're doing lots of other stuff. So, you know, in Norfolk, there's um, a bunch of, you know, either landscape recovery projects or nature recovery projects or so on in the area. So the habitat management stuff is happening. The predator mitigation side of things is you know kind of happening as well um and as to whether it works beats me <laughs> well yeah they, I, I they guess... clearly they learn how to be curlies but mm. are they going to come back to breed who knows time, time will tell and i time guess as tell. you said if it's integrated into everything else as well then yeah it's probably a, a part of hopefully what's going to become a, a, a good successful yeah area. and it's like um, at, at what scale will they return to breed so some of the other projects that have been running longer. So the, the first WWT release that was done from Airfield Birds back in 2019. So there's about, they released 50 birds. They know that about, I think, a third of those are still alive now. So that's kind of what you would expect mm. for care of these. Um, so that's what we're four years on now. Um, so there's about 20 birds, which they know because they see them in the winter on the Southern okay. are still alive. They've only, they know where about six of them breed so far. Four of them in the Severn Vale, two of them elsewhere. One in Wales, Shropshire, the other in the Thames Valley. Okay. So where are the other ones? <laughs> Don't know. No, it's good though, because it, I mean, it shows it does work. You know, they are out there and they are breeding. So yeah. as far as I'm concerned, you know, if it creates one more curlew in the, in the wild, it's, it's yeah. worth doing. So yeah. 
Um, and uh, Steve said, Steve Hallam um, said, I think you said that omni predators, e.g., foxes and badgers, are particularly common in the UK. Any thoughts on why this should be? Uh -huh, just, yeah. There was a study, wasn't there? They were looking. Yeah, looking, lots yeah. of different, lots of different reasons. Um, so these sort of generalist predators, um, foxes, crows, badgers, uh, ravens. Um, yeah. So various reasons that have been put out there. One that everybody, particularly conservationists and sort of wildlife nature enthusiasts, like the point the finger at is um, non-native game bird release, pheasants and red leg partridges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, providing a supplementary food source for predators like foxes and so on that sustains these um, populations through the winter where otherwise they would be knocked back by winter weather. Yep. One possible, re possible reason. Um, also, there's just like a lot of food for predators in the landscape. Mm. You know, we have very mild winters. There's a lot of, you know, wastage and um, spillage that goes on from um, farms, agricultural sites. Urban centers provide um, obviously a massive food source for foxes and how far foxes roam away from urban centers, obviously a big question. Um, there's a couple of studies that have done actual GPS tracking of foxes, showing that they can have quite a big range, including visiting both areas of the countryside and urban areas. Um, and so that's kind of in, in some countries, like in the Netherlands, they've you know been working on waders, like the equivalent of BTO has been working on waders for a really long time. They're kind of starting to shift their focus towards looking at the predators now because they know mm -hmm. predators are the cause generally of poor breeding success and population declines. What are the predators doing? What is their distribution like? Um, and what is their behavior like that then will go on to impact and um, okay. ground nursing bird breeding success? Okay. Um, yeah, so lots of different reasons. Probably, again, kind of like um, the reasons for population declines of waders and the reasons for poor breeding success um, varies between different areas. Similarly, mm. the reasons for high predator numbers in certain areas um really really differs so yeah just a shame that predator fencing is so costly i guess but um yeah yeah so, yeah like, and you know maybe... supplementary food in any given yeah. uh, breeding season you know foxes and crows they're not out there to specifically they're not waiter special well a few might be waiter specialists you might have you know like marsh harriers on a nature reserve which have learned to target waiters as a food source um but you know generalist predators they just eat waiter nests because they stumble across them yeah. um, and the rest of the year they're not any waiter nests so you know what are they eating because yeah. they're being oh. sustained somehow yeah. um, it's kind of like looking at those alternative food sources okay um, and I think that's about it Brian Cox said great talk thank you so yeah, I think on that note I'm, I'm sure everyone watching um, really enjoyed it I thoroughly enjoyed it thank you so much I'm hoping that Sue's still out there to come back in and say cheerio bye here she comes oh, oh yep. Sue and Alan there you go <laughs> Coming was, and going. Your audience. <laughs> Hi, uh, that was that was really good, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Because for the likes of us, we we have no idea. You you go out and you see all these waders. You know, when you go to your nature reserves and what have you, and you see lots of them, and you think, oh, great, you know, but you don't really think about how they're really going to carry on being there. You just <laughs> All we see are the adults that keep coming back and keep coming back. Um, mm. And you have no idea about the fact that they're not actually breeding as, as well as they should be. And obviously um, a lot of the ones that we see on in the winter on East Coast estuaries, like in Essex and Norfolk and Suffolk, um, are from the continent. They're not even our breeding birds. Some they? of them are our breeding birds, but they're, a lot of them are from the continent. Finland, Netherlands, Germany where they're doing just as badly you know it's not just us <laughs> we're not doing you know things terribly in the uk um you know they're in just as dire straits for many of the same reasons in a lot of these countries even somewhere where you think of like finland as being like very wild and natural um they're doing badly there as well yeah but i think what fills me with hope though is that obviously the amount of work that that people are doing yeah you know, just just looking at those graphs and maps and it really opens your eyes as to what's involved it's not just a question of someone going out and saying yeah there was 30 curlew in that field there and and that's less than last year yeah. you're analyzing everything to the nth degree yeah. um, and that's got to fill you with hope for the future because with that much effort going in and so many people in partnership as well 
hopefully in, in, in another you know five 10 15 and, years we'll be we'll be in a better and place. really we all do have an individual role to play like um one of your questions from one of the audience members was you know what can i do um mm -hmm. there's a, a german researcher who's been studying the population in northern germany for 10 years who's done a lot of you know i've collected loads of data on that population they've thrown nest fencing you know um, crop sacrifice um, with their farmers at care of these populations still going down estimated time to extinction is about 15 to 20 years um, even with throwing you know everything at that population and you know fundamentally she says it's a wake-up call we yeah. all have a part to play because it's this um it's the whole sort of agricultural food production system that is driving the declines of these birds that depend on agricultural grassland landscapes and it's our choices in terms of food choices and so on that are contributing to that so if nothing else that is something that that we can do and it's our choices as consumers that will then go on to making those economic um, pressures that will change the farming system and the, the economic structures that support it um, to have more nature-friendly farming for example fingers mm -hmm. crossed well, we can all do yep. all do our bit <laughs> yeah we genuinely yeah. can mm. Right. Okay. Um, I think uh, I think I'm I'm done. There's nothing else here. Uh, John John Clark and Brian Priestley again have both said uh, excellent presentation and interesting stuff. Thanks, Sam. So lots and lots of positive feedback. And and yeah, thank you very much indeed. All right. Thank you. A pleasure to speak to you guys again.